At the start of the month, 26 new words of Korean origin were added to the Oxford English Dictionary. It seemed to be a bigger indication of Hallyu's popularity, which, by the way, was one of the words included on this year's list. Food words like banchan, bulgogi, and chimek, yum, they made the cut. As did unique Korean phrases once just deemed lost in translation like tebak or fighting. It was an exciting observation from afar, but we got curious about the process. How are these words selected, and who deliberates on its addition to the Oxford English Dictionary? So today we connect with someone who was on the decision-making committee, Associate Professor in Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford. She also specializes in Korean language and linguistics. Professor Jin Kier, she joins us on the line from the UK. Good morning, Professor Kier. Good morning. I heard that you've been having busy weeks. How are you doing this morning? Uh, yes, I'm. I'm yeah, I've been busy suddenly last two weeks uh, from many interviews or you know, from all over the world. So I'd be very happy being here 20 years. And I think I've never seen Korean culture and language being so popular where actually not just some people but general public showing such interest. I'm really happy with this boom. <laughs> you must be busy, but you sound excited about this uh, perhaps new chapter in Korean contents, Korean language, and its popularity. So I do want to start out with a big question. Uh, as a consultant for the Oxford English Dictionary, could you explain to us what the process was like to choose words for the dictionary this time around? Yes, yeah, so basically... Um, the, the frequency is the main criteria for Oxford English Dictionary. So mm. um, in the past, Oxford English Dictionary only looked at the sort of main media. But for the last uh, almost seven, eight years, they started to look at social media, so just basically to see how you know the people, ordinary people use the words and so on. So um, and since then, they uh, pick up, uh, based on this frequ- frequency criteria, they pick up so many Korean words. Mm. And I was consulting with them about those words for the last few years. And they decide to uh, include those words uh, in the OED. Once the OED, uh, once the words enter into OED, they never leave, which means that they'll be there forever. That's so right. it's really significant. And uh, yeah, and again, like it's not like um, you know. So the frequency was the main criteria, and the popularity of Hallyu made those words very popular among uh, global fandom English speakers. And this is the reason why we. Uh, included 26 words, and many more words will be included in the near future. Mm, things like Squid Game, BTS might have all helped a great deal. Who knew that hashtags could be such an important indicator in trying to figure out that frequency? Uh, just observing from afar, Professor Kier, uh, and as an avid follower of Korean contents, it's really thrilling to see these Korean words be recognized on an official English dictionary of all things OED, the Oxford English Dictionary. But excitement mm-hmm. aside, we do want to try to gauge its significance. Are 26 Korean words being added to the Oxford Dictionary significant? Absolutely. I mean, there's never been at any time or from any language which had so many influx in one year. Um, I, this is kind of my research specialty about you know, Mexico encounters between English and other languages, other languages, and there's never been a time when you know like 26 words entered in the one year mm-hmm. from one language. Mm-hmm. So this is very much unprecedented. And also the words that we look at those uh, words, well, we, even if we coin them as Korean words, most of them actually Korean people would not necessarily call them as Korean words. And many of the words like chimego or mukbang would not be even in Korean language dictionary. So I call them. So translingual words or transcultural words mm. uh, through Korean way. They have Korean language heritage, but kind of more known global as the most key word. Mm. So I, and it's very significant also because once uh, OED accepts 26 words and more, these words will be also added into other English language dictionary too, and other language dictionary too, and other language users too. So this means that these words and the culture accompanying, accompanying those words will be visible throughout global um Asia, mm. it's really significant, uh, I think. And also, when you think about the impact of OED and the impact of English language in the global language and culture, I think this was a very significant uh, event. You know, actually, you raise a really good point because words like timeg, which is, you know, kind of a combination of two words shortened uh, chicken, fried chicken, yes. and mikju, yes. right? Uh, beer. Yes. And uh, yes. Korean yes. linguists might not actually be excited about shortening or any of these abbreviations. But as you said, these mm-hmm. are considered transcultural word. That's that's exciting. Yeah, I mean, this uh, translingual or transcultural word, which I coined in my book 2018, 
But it's really interesting because uh, these words very much English entered into Korean language, Korean since the 120 years. And the way how we use English, not only in the past we just received all the words, but what happens uh, in Korea and also in many of East Asia for the last 40 years is that we able to make our own English words and our own English culture and many of you know, the vocabulary, everyday vocabulary that we have in South Korea are actually you know, hybrid English words. Mm. And they are very much like in the past considered as Konglish words, which are <laughs> sort of like wrong or legitimate words. But I'm arguing that these words will be our cultural assets. Mm. Well, not only for us, but for many people. So this is very exciting that the, the point of view or perspective are changing mm. that from something that has not been correct to be a cool word or beautiful word or like more you know, necessary word, something like skinky, which is, in the past they thought it is a wrong word, but now they think also, well, this is fascinating, cool word. So I think the perspective of people, uh, viewers globally are changing. So, yeah. mm. Uh, I do have to ask, because there was such a wide selection of inclusion on the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, this year. There were food-related words like pantan, bulgogi, timek, again, culture-related words like mokbang, k-drama, hallyu. And then there was these uniquely Korean concepts like oppa and onni, which are just frankly lost in translation in just about every movie or TV drama subtitles. How did you select which Korean words got added uh, beyond frequency, that is? It's a very interesting point because in the past, when we do not have uh, drama or, or film, when we just have you know the textual translation, those words are all anglicized and those, as you said. But mm. because when uh, when you play the drama and film, people can actually hear all those words all the time. Mm. The words that you mentioned, like relational terms like "upa," "onni," and "tongue" or "nuna," mm. these words or like a lot of food-related culinary words, they always hear it mm. uh, and they will also remember those words together with the image and contextualized situation. So these words actually remain a sound footage. So people don't forget and, uh, you know, so they uh, remember those words. This is, in a way, the best way to teach language. You know, you, know, you people remember those words in a in very much embodied situation. Mm. So what we see here is that drama and film not only kind of contributed to, in a way, uh, you know, exporting culture, but also did a great job in teaching language itself to the global fandom because people remember those words talk about those words in social media in a romanized form. And because of that romanized form being circulated so much, this is how OED uh, took notice of these words and uh, actually took those words into uh, dictionary. If one asked Korean uh, linguists which words should, be enter, should enter OED, they wouldn't recommend those words. But these words actually been so frequently used by fandom who remember through um, by, by watching K-drama or mm. K-film, so these OS sort of sound footage. Uh, so, yeah. Um, it's uh, fascinating in a way that we think about those words, uh, you know, as a sound footage, uh, kind of remained uh, through uh, through the fandom. You know, I can hear it in your voice how exciting you find this sort of transition. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is, it is such a transition, and uh, in a way, like you know, we don't have to keep ask people to remember those words. Mm. People remember those words, and those was a uh, sound footage that you remember and you want to know more and. The one of the words that I was I come across last uh, through the workshop was people asking me what the meaning of this and that, oppa and gambu, all these words, and it was very interesting. Yeah. How do you even begin to explain what gambu is? <laughs> yes, the gambu is a really interesting word because gambu is not in Korean dictionary, any of Korean dictionaries. Many Koreans don't really know what gambu is, so I had to research what gambu uh, actually meant. And no way, what it, but there are so many people when I did the uh, uh, the workshop and um, quick game translation asked me about Gambu. So, uh, and as Gambu only appeared only once or twice in the entire uh, entire series. Mm. So what I uh, found really interesting is, uh, you know, that actually I'm learning too what Gambu means and they were so learning together. It's something like, well, I couldn't say that this is Korean word, but this is kind of word born again through this particular uh, drama, but it's sort of the meaning wise, we are all kind of make meanings together and we find mm. the meaning together. So, Probably, I would say, Gambu is more popular right now in English language than in Korean language. Mm. And people will like put the meaning what that actually means first in English rather than in Korea. So, it's again, very interesting um, phenomenon, yes. Uh, you naturally took me to my next question. You are in the midst of this uh, four-week seminar on translation of Squid Game. I do wonder, was this prompted by maybe even the disgruntlement around the existing translations? Because there was a lot of back and forth. In fact, it continues to be a yes. point of contention online. Yes. 
I, 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 this is kind of like, you know, I've been asked so many media, UK, US, uh, to com- comment on this translation, whether this is right or wrong. Mm. But I declined the, the request because the, the two languages are so different. It's inevitable that you kind of, you know, miss out or, you know, you can't do perfect translation. There's untranslatable, of course, so much because Korean is much more, you know, uh, rich, pragmatic language, whereas in English you don't have many terms of address or, you know, is many affection. So the two languages are very much different in a way. In that in the sense, uh, translation, complete, perfect translation is impossible. So the translation workshop that I'm doing is not like pointing out this translation wrong, it's that translation mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. but I'm trying to give more sense of the deeper understanding of Korean language and culture. And it's been uh, very much, you know, uh, I never expected as many uh, people being showing interest, so I'm very <laughs> excited about that. <laughs> so it's, from what I'm gathering, it's more of an open-ended discussion, not necessarily taking apart what is wrong and what is maybe the best way to translate. Um, did you come across any interesting conversation points during these four-week seminars, or can you not disclose that information? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, like, so basically the first seminar I did based on what I prepared, but from, but from the second one I'm doing, I'm crowdsourcing the questions from the viewers, mm. and it's fascinating. I, I can't really give you the you know exact question, but the you know, the really uh, amazing, really interesting questions. And uh, so they send me the questions, and based on this cross-sourcing, I'm doing seminar one after the other. Uh, but uh, it has been really amazing, the questions are amazing. And as a linguist, I'm really interested because the translation has been very often uh, uh, belonged to specialists, language specialists alone. And many, many times the, the general audience were recipients. But now what I notice is that it's changing, that you know, general people are very much like interested in the nuance, the meaning behind, and they want to talk about it. I think this is really a new transition from you know, uh, translation history. <laughs> I find it very <laughs> exciting and interesting, yeah. Uh, the thing is, uh, when I was studying in the States, I, my uh, departments, uh, when I went to study maybe Asian history, uh, the Korean department was actually pretty limited. And I do wonder, with the recent Hallyu wave, has that changed things for you, particularly at the department you work at? How has the popularity of Korean language and cultural exports affected the Asian department there overall? Yeah, I think it's changing very, very fast. For example, like uh, we're doing sort of, um, you know, uh, we are offering some Korean courses for Korean university students. So mm. um, in the past, we, like maybe one class was enough. But I had to this term. Uh, actually, yesterday I had to make it three three classes. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's uh, I mean, it's basically in this situation with COVID, it's difficult to find really big lecturer school. But I had to uh, go out and make uh, you know three different bookings, and then there's more. But I I just can't. Uh, <laughs> you know, the demand demand is so much high. If I open the you know registration, it will go up uh, very easily. You know, mm. hundred or two hundred. So I have to close. I have to close it. You know. But to be so in I such can demand, really how, yeah, uh, yeah. And also in the past, many times in the US or UK, when you open three language uh, courses, very often you feel like uh, see that more of them are heritage uh, students, so like they have some Korean heritage. Mm. But now uh, yesterday when I went to the classroom, um, none of them were heritage students, but all of them basically were locals, which was also, I think, very uh, big change and shift. Mm. You could imagine, yeah, you can expect, yeah. Mm. I think it sort of really shows very, uh, you know, the, the dynamic or, you know, the, the audience, people talking about K-drama all mm. changes. It's not like Korean people talking about it or someone who's been to Korea, but people who have never been to Korea now talks about K-drama. Mm-hmm. And then it's very interesting, before people were talking about Korean drama, but nowadays people talk about K-drama, and it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they likely saw OED put K as a prefix, which uh, <laughs> you know, refers to Korean drama, I mean, Korean wave. And it's really amazing that, you know, we kind of got K as to refer to Korean Korean culture. So, K-anything, <laughs> K-pop, very, very K-drama, K-food, you name it. <laughs> exactly. And they uh, kind of Kind of, kind of the K in the English language now is kind of almost considered as something very cool. Mm. So anything with K, people think, oh, this is very cool. This is very, uh, you know, fun thing. So it has, I think, though, in a way, we we, got, we made the branding of K news really well in global uh right now. If I'm not overstepping, uh, because we use, we put K in front of just about everything, that's a buzzword. Uh, you know, I was getting a little bit tired of the trend and thought, oh, is it not trendy to add K in front of everything anymore? But to hear a confirmation from you saying that it's actually the cool thing to do, maybe we ought to jump yes. on board. <laughs> 
All right. <laughs> From a country that once imported culture, now an exporter of an array of it, uh, what do you attribute to this major transition? I'm sure streaming sites are a big thing, social media presence. I mean, we can find mm-hmm. these niche groups more easily, and it makes that, well, uh, the introduction to a brand new culture a lot more accessible, right? Yes, absolutely. I, I can talk about this from translation perspective again, like uh, in the last 120 years, we translated so many things from English to Korean, but somehow, like, you know, we never really got to the point that we were able to translate uh, what we have got, you know, our cultural language and everything into English. So we're very much behind in translating our, our you know, our stuff into English in a way that we really didn't make uh, effort enough to make ourselves known to the world. Mm-hmm. But actually, from a linguistic perspective, what I can see is also what K-Wave fandom did in particularly Southeast Asia, or the initial K-Wave fans, who were actually, uh, their main, their mother tongue were English. They were able, they did great job in terms of like translating, letting our K-Wave con- uh, content known to the global stage. So, you know, so many things are being translated and known through, through their, their work. Mm. And I really appreciate what they've done. Mm-hmm. But I think also, like, you know, like when you, going back to your question about, you know, now we are more or less uh, at the stage of in, exporting our culture rather than uh, importing all mm. the time. I think it's also from um, English viewers or global viewers perspective, I, it really, uh, I think, tells us the need for diversification from English perspective. So, you know, when you think about English language, it's full of loan words, full of the words from everywhere. Mm. And when you think about... Uh, you know, people who are speaking English mm. nowadays, it, as a ling- English being lingua franca, it, you can't just imagine like your particular region or people, but, you know, English being spoken so many uh, everywhere mm. uh, by everyone. And people in, uh, you know, demographic characteristics in U.S. and U.K. is so multilingual and multicultural. Mm. What it means is that people want to have some diversity, not mm. only in their culture, but in language too. Mm. And in that sort of that gap, uh, I think K-Wave really feels and satisfies their the viewers. I think the need for diversification, there is a sort of growing need. And I think the K-Wave really did uh, really hit that gap. And I think also it's kind of encouraging what K-Wave did, because, you know, other Asian cultures are probably, probably unknown, I mean, not very well known, or mm-hmm. underrepresented uh, languages and culture also can take courage to uh, uh, think about, you know, oh, our yeah. language and culture also. Be like K-Wave, <laughs> and to be known, introduced and enjoyed by the global fandom. So this is a very encouraging message, I think. Oh, I think so, too. I mean, I think you had a point of message about diversity, right? And I think there is a growing demand to diversify contents in general that was largely centered around, as you've said, these maybe even English made contents to that reach a bigger audience. Now we just appreciate kind of like what Bong Joon-ho said on, on his Oscar speech, right? If you can appreciate exactly, yeah. or get over that yeah. tiny, tiny border that is at the bottom mm-hmm. of your screen, then yeah, then it opens up a wide yeah. range of perhaps brand new cultures. Yeah. Based on your expert opinion, uh, what kind of changes do you foresee for the Korean language, Professor Kier? Uh So I think sort of this is good, kind of going back to my research on translingual words, uh, which I wrote in 2018. But basically, I think it's kind of, you know, in the future, maybe, you know, by 10 years time, kind of the nation state border of language, like if this is Korean or this is English or you know, this is Chinese or Japanese, I think these borders will become much more or less, uh, less visible. And you know, when you think about the Chimek as you know entering the, the OED, well, you know, you talk about the identity of Chimek. What is you know, where does this belong to? When you think about this, a bit of Korean, <laughs> bit of English, bit of Chinese. So I think what it tells us that uh, you know, the language itself will be diversified, but also like the border between the languages, between languages will sort of uh, you know more and more disappear. And I think when I think about Korean language, the future of Korean language, I think we should also. We, the Korean language will be more diversified than ever. And I think it's still, you know, even now it's very diverse. When you think about the lexicon, the vocabulary, uh, it's so diverse. And you can't just say this is Korean, this is hybrid word, this is English word. It's that, the distinction of that is very difficult to make. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm expecting that the Korean language will be more diversified and we should also welcome the diversity, not like uh, having some prescriptive view that this is real Korean, this is not real <laughs> Korean. <laughs> so we have to have more, you know, Kind of broaden, we have to broaden our view about Korean language and Korean words. I think that uh, because this is what is going to happen uh, mm-hmm. for all languages, and this is the way how K Wave also enters the global stage. 
Thank you very much for your insight today. This was indeed a tebak conversation. <laughs> I understand your schedule is keeping you busy, so fighting. <laughs> we hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you very much, Professor Kier. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.